I think it's important as esports grows um, that we always remember our history. And, and certain organizations have been around longer than others. And, and I think remembering that history and, and pointing to our roots is important to keep us grounded. You know, esports has grown tremendously um, in the past just five to seven years. Some of us have been lucky enough to kind of be around for, for different eras of esports and, and ride this roller roller coaster of an ecosystem. But talk to me a little bit about, you know, <clears throat> what does it mean being in blast given the, the deep roots that both NIP and FaZe have? I mean, I think it's been pretty exciting for us as a newer org relative to the kind of legacies of NIP and complexity to kind of see the space continually grow every single year, which has been a super cool thing to talk about and to look at and to, you know, be at some of these events with everybody cheering wildly and, you know, repping uh, our brand, you know, yelling, like chanting FaZe up, basically. It's been a really, really cool thing to see. Um, you know. We're excited about the kind of the future and where it's going to be going to, but like recognizing that we're standing on the shoulders of other giants who've come before that have built everything, which has been really cool to see. Like that it's not as young as everybody's kind of talking about. Right. It's been around for a minute and it's gone through so many iterations and jumps forward and then a couple steps back and then big leap forward, a couple steps back. So it's like really cool to see it continue to do that. And the last three years have been incredible. Um, I mean, technically speaking, I think we've been in for about four years now, but. Uh, it's uh, really, really excited for the future overall, and so really excited to make you know make sure that on our side, Phase Clan's a continually more well-known brand within the Counter Strike ecosystem. For me, it is also like I came in three years ago, and NIP. If you start reviewing the history, it's 20 years of history. Yeah. And when you start reviewing the footage and the material back to CPL in 2001, and you you, you go through that, and then I feel like some sort of um, coming in for the last three years when, when you boomed, I missed that history. So I don't have that sentimental connection to it. But from what I really like about what has happened during those three years that I've been here, uh, and especially with what you look at with Blast, is that three years ago, no tournament organizers were talking to the teams or tournament or uh, tournament organizers in between to work to build and actually develop the ecosystem. So for me, it's really cool to see the hobby level in the footage and the nostalgic moments you can see to actually today uh, professionalizing the industry, sitting down, discussing important issues, collaborate on important issues, work on solving them, and, and for the long term and the longevity of having a sustainable and functional ecosystem, I would say. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize <clears throat> how far back our history goes. I remember in uh, 2004, you know, when we hit 30,000 viewers, it was like mind boggling. Like we couldn't even believe it. This is pre YouTube, definitely pre Twitch. It was pre Facebook, like, you know, ancient times for today's technology. And, and to think of some of the legends like Keaton and, and Potty and the SK crews and NOA and Team 3D and Counter Strike has a very rich history. Um, arguably richer than any of the big esports today. You know, Quake and, and some of the Street Fighters and things might predate it. Um, but as far as, you know, tier one esports of today, Counter Strike has um, the richest history, richer than a League of Legends, um, you know, right up there uh, alongside Dota. And, and I think it's really interesting that some of those teams, you know, are, are still around today. And, and a lot of the younger viewers that kind of came up through you know Twitch and and, and YouTube Live, um, might not realize how far back some of the brands go, and I think it's uh, it's very cool, and I think it's one thing that makes Counter Strike special in the esports ecosystem. Well, it's also cool to see a lot of those legendary players that are still tied to the game yeah. at a lot of levels, you know, at a four, lot of levels. Four, four is so. 15 years down the line. Exactly. Turning 33 babies. Yeah. And, and even the pros <laughs> that aren't playing that are working on kind of in the management or in you know, like building some of the next generation of products, I think is a really, really cool thing, which speaks to the passion that everybody has towards this game and yep. building it out for the future. Absolutely. I think it's, it is interesting, as you were speaking to like that period in 04, it was hard to get the word out about things. Now it's kind of like there's so much going on that you need to lean on everybody kind of promoting something because there's a very crowded space of a lot of things happening. But also these, the players and the orgs themselves have a much larger loudspeaker to be able to communicate, this is what's happening, this is what's going on. And so I think 
And, and I think for the most part, a lot of the teams have leaned in very heavily towards making sure that this space continues to grow, but also the players have, have uh, I mean, several of them now are very, very large and, and kind of fall into that influencer status uh, and can themselves drive and promote like events that are happening overall in the space. And I think that's been a very, very cool thing to see just how many hardcore fans are, are able to, to tune in and follow them. And, and really support the space. Yeah, well, I think what's most remarkable, if you look like the last three, four years, I would say looking at players transitioning from gamers with a passion to actually taking and starting to take responsibility as role models, as influencers, and, 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 and us as organizations also taking that seriously in the terms of you're talking about 30,000 viewers. Mm -hmm. Now, I think most of us consider 30,000 viewers for some content piece or an event as a big failure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and realizing that with, uh, with that also comes a lot of responsibility, not only for us as teams, but also down to the player level, also from the organizer level and so forth as well. What's really satisfying for me <coughs> to watch um, is the maturation of the, of the player experience and lifestyle as this digital sport continues to grow. I break it down, <coughs> the history of esports, around the player, eSports 1.0, eSports 2.0, and 3.0. eSports 1.0, players lived in mom's basement, and they might see their teammates twice a year in person, usually CPL winter, CPL summer. Um, but for the most part, you know, you just played together online. E eSports 2.0 was the dawn of the team house era, where teams started moving together in a house with their coach, and they'd work together there and teams would get better much faster. The problem was you were living with your coworkers and it caused a lot of teams, you know, to kind of implode. You come home and, <laughs> and your boyfriend, with your boyfriend and girlfriend and your teammates are there. You want to brush your teeth, you know, your teammates are there. You go make a sandwich, your teammates are there. So that caused problems. Esports 3.0 is what I think a lot of teams are entering now with our new headquarters and, and living situations. For us, our, the, our players live in luxury apartments about a mile from our facility. Um, they get breakfast and lunch five days a week at the Dallas Cowboys training table, which is where their players eat. They get free gym membership on property. They get their physicals and pre preventive medical care at a sports hospital across the street. And then they can come to work um, in our facility and train with their coaches and analysts and, and scouts. And, and at the end of the day, they get to go back to their private apartment. They can have a life. Their parents can come into town to visit or, or what it might be. Um, and although it is cha more challenging these days for players, uh, in terms of like handling social media and, 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 and the pressures of a high exposure business. I think in many, many ways, um, the way esports has grown has been beneficial for the players. They leave, lead healthier lives um, and have much better experiences than in the past. Well, you also have this new generation of players that are um, grown up in this. And so they're ready yeah. for the self-promotion part because they've been inadvertently doing it as they've been building because they know it's a part of how they get to the next level. Yeah. And I think also with, you know, within Counter-Strike, you have to be, you have to perform to be seen, but you also have to kind of self-promote to get to the next level to be seen as well. And I think uh, you've got this next crop um, that has, that is fully geared up, ready for that, that's been learning, same thing, standing on the shoulders of the previous generation uh, to get there. And so you're getting these almost more polished, uh, social kind of ready players, ready to kind of move on and scale up. And so, you know, they can almost plug into the orgs even easier and, and, uh, and then just kind of are ready to keep on growing their own brands individually. I think it comes down to 20 years of learning. Right. And now finally you have a structure right. in place which the players kind of come into. Yeah. And it has been developed, it has been tweaked uh, in terms of if you, if you look at our team as an example, we have a young generation of players, we have an older generation of the players, they're different. But it's kind of like, for me personally, I'm the oldest sibling, <laughs> and my little sister, which is 10 years younger, she says that I carved the way for her, right? Because the older players were experimenting and kind of shaping what it is today, trying and failing, and the new players are coming into a structures that exists now that didn't exist an exposure that exists now that didn't exist. So it's much more easier to come in young and grow. Um, and I, I don't know if the, the older players would wish they would be younger today, I would say. I think the biggest um, difficulty from, at least our perspective from multi-gaming organization is you have all these parallel conversations that need just as much attention 
whether it's with the publisher if they're active or it's with the tournament organizers and then the teams that need to be looked after so you can't just kind of leave them be. Um, you know, we haven't, as FaceLine, we haven't focused as much on some of the infrastructure build out. We have a very decentralized kind of structure in the world that comes, I think, from also our interactions with our influencers and, and content creators. Um, and I think that's, at some point, we will turn that corner um, as we see it kind of necessary. Um, but we are kind of much more decentralized in terms of where our teams are around the world instead of kind of focusing them in on one place. Um, but yeah, I think that it's managing all of those, uh, honestly, individually scaling kind of businesses um, can be cumbersome at certain points. It's still, though, really exciting because many of them are scaling at different speeds and some of them have much longer horizons for growth, some much shorter bursts, but at the same time, a lot of optimism. Um, you know, we lean much more heavy in shooters and it's been really exciting to see a lot of the brands embrace kind of the shooter uh, game genre, which, you know, you go back two years and it was, it was, it was a scary proposition for certain uh, mainstream brands to, to participate. So um, I think that's been super exciting overall. But, uh, but yeah, I think you guys have much different experiences with infrastructure in terms of where you're consolidating your teams. So. Definitely. I think if you look at, from our part, the legacy is Counter-Strike, right? So if you go back and wind the clock, uh, you will see that it was essentially one team, a team manager maybe, and a coach, which was kind of operating with maybe a social media person or something, then suddenly you add more teams. Um, audience get larger, viewerships get larger, and then when you add teams, you have need for more staff, you have more need for resources. Kind of in the beginning, many of the teams, I would say, they were operating decentralized as well. You had a social media person sitting in his bedroom doing something, then you had some video guys you rented <laughs> yep. in, then there were some people handling uh, practical stuff somewhere else. And when you now have a broad scope of teams, and as you say, they need the same attention, there's also partnerships and deliverables there, there's a competitive and performance aspect with mental coaching, nutrition, conflict solving uh, in these groups of, of young players very often. It's very important to, to bring all of that together for a more efficient workflow and in order to, to, to kind of develop it, I would say. Because if you would operate with a team localized somewhere, at least in my opinion, and have a management team somewhere else and a content creation team uh, at another location, you, you can't really efficiently scale or professionalize the business. So I think that's the direction you're seeing where you're bringing players together to one location where you have the whole organization, the content creation, the partnership deliverables, the competitive performance and development aspect. And that is, that is just, a, it's just the nature of how, how big the industry uh, has grown over the last couple of years, that it's inevitable. Yeah, I think the beauty of being diversified in multiple games is that you can market for your partners and for your organization um, to a, a lot of different gaming communities and provide that diversification. Um, the challenge, as you guys have said, is that requires scale, uh, requires more people, requires more money. Um, for many organizations, it requires you know facilities and infrastructure, um, and it can be challenging on management. You know, which is us. You know, I always say esports is 24/7, 365, and you know, many times I work on Christmas Day because not all cultures celebrate Christmas, and you know, you've got one team in this part of the world and another team in that part of the world, and somebody forgot their visa, and you know, it, it's. It's nonstop. Um, if that's a type of thing uh, a certain individual thrives on, I think they would really enjoy esports. But if you're used to just kind of getting tunnel vision and focusing on one thing, this might not be the space for you. <coughs> oh, because, please. bless you. <clears throat> because to really do this business right, in my opinion, it's best to be diversified you know, across those games. A high percentage of people kind of focus on one esport. So if you want to uh, be able to speak to as many gamers as possible, that's the right business model. But it is challenging. Um, definitely keeps you on your toes. So uh, 2020, blast. What are you guys most excited about for your organizations? To win the regular season, both of them, and then the global final as well on top. I mean, likewise. 
Well, the we can't not, all win it. Yeah, I was, yeah, it, was like, it was like, no, for I'm the most part. I'm not planning on losing to any of you guys. So. <laughs> right? I, uh, I think it's going to well, be a really we'll fun see. circuit all around the world. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to have some really incredible players. Uh, I really like how Blast has organized everything. I think we've got some wonderful organizations, and I'm, I'm honored and, and blessed to be a part of it. And I think 2020 is going to be great. Likewise, likewise. We're entering eSports 3.0, as you say, and this is what's needed. Mm -hmm.